Okay, let's try this again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being at Bible study. <laughs> Amen. Don't you just love electronics? I wish they work. <laughs> Kid. Yeah, I was on the phone with somebody recently and they were having a computer problem. And, and she had me on hold, but she didn't actually put me on hold. She had things. She said, Why is it doing this? What's wrong with this thing? <laughs> She'd be falling, Mr. Arlen said, I'm feeling you there. <laughs> he said, oh, well, I thought I, you could hear that. I said, yeah, I heard it. I was just, I said, they gave me a, that was better than that little elevator music. That's right. The whole thing. <laughs> that was real. But, yeah. But, yeah, praise God. It's good to be together. It's been good to worship. Man, the praise reports and testimonies are wonderful. Man, aren't you glad whenever somebody else shares their breakthrough? Yeah. My goodness, that's a faith builder. But if God helped them, he helps us, helps all of us. So tonight we're going to jump back into the Word. Okay, and I'm going to do kind of just a brief, like a little tiny review to bring us into where we are now. All right, so last week we're actually in Acts chapter 5, and uh, we looked, I forgot where we started. I think it's like verse 1, yeah, verse 1 through 16 last week. But we're going to look at verse 14 through 16. We're going to pick up at verse 17 and see how far we get. Because this is, I think, you know, the, 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 the day of Pentecost has happened. The Holy Spirit came. The people were baptized in, in him and Holy Spirit. And they're just continuing to share the good news. And they're actually, they're healing a lot of the apostles and disciples. Are, there are lots of people being healed. People are being added to their number daily. And that's what we're going to pick up. I'm not going to do a lot of review about last week. But verse 14 says, continually more and more people believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Great crowds of both men and women. In fact, when people knew Peter was going to walk by, they carried the sick out to the streets and laid them down on cots and mats, knowing the incredible power emanating from him would overshadow them and heal them. And like I said last week, the overshadow here isn't just like you know a sun shadow coming come off his body. It's the same word used whenever uh, Gabriel came to Mary and said, the power of the Most High will overshadow you and you'll bear a son. And then on the Mount of Transfiguration, the same word overshadows That's the three examples. This one and those two, it means this, this amazing, tremendous power of God that's emanating and it's just literally consuming the atmosphere. So overshadow here is a big deal. All right, so it says the power is emanating and overshadow is just literally driving out the sickness and disease and everything around him as he walked through. All right. And 16, so great numbers of people swarmed into Jerusalem from nearby villages. They brought with them the sick and those troubled by demons, and everyone was healed. Isn't that great? Man. See, the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, they didn't have that kind of power. They had a lot of rules and regulations, didn't they? But they did not have that. You know, Jesus, he really did bring in a new way, didn't he? The new covenant, which means agreement. It was brand new. I mean, everybody else was just trying to somehow or another please God. He was, he was making a way that was so freeing and so abundant and so amazing, wasn't it? I mean, it was just different. You can imagine those people were so religious that it was they were stuck. And here comes the new way that was Jesus. Oh, yes, I love you enough. I'll heal you. I'll help you. I'll meet your needs. I'll provide for you. And by the way, I can give you eternal life. I am your Messiah. And they're like, whoa, I can imagine it took them all back. But the people loved Jesus. We saw that all through the, my gosh, we studied several books in the last five years since the church started. But everywhere you see it talking about Jesus, the people loved Jesus. The religious people didn't like him, but the common people always loved him. And we're going to see a little bit more of that. So we're going to pick up our study in verse 17. It says, the high priest and his officials, who formed the party of the Sadducees, became extremely jealous over all that was happening. <laughs> yeah. In verse 18, and you remember, I, I mentioned this before, Whenever it comes to them putting someone in jail or prison, I like to go to the older translations because the newer translations have made it too polite. They say they arrested them. Almost like they said, would you please come with me? No, the old translations say like, well, they laid hands on. So I always like to go with the old translation whenever somebody gets locked up because it's all oh, they laid hands on. They grabbed them and pulled them out to the side and put them in the common prison. And see, it's because the Sadducees were jealous, and they had the dominant role in the Sanhedrin Council at that point. The Sadducees did, and normally they pretty much kept, the, the most of the high priests were Sadducees. Very few of them were Pharisees. 
But so they were jealous because here's, you know, these apostles, this new system of belief that's based on somebody they murdered. They already don't like that. But they're preaching resurrection. And remember, the Sadducees hated that. There was no, there was no spirit, no angel, no afterlife, no resurrection of them. Unless you did what you did in your life, and then when you, were, you died, you were done. There was no afterlife. And I heard the first pastor, he said, that's why they were sad, you see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I still remember, that was 35 years ago. Look, that's pretty crazy. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, uh-huh. it's amazing what sticks. Yeah. Yeah. It's even more amazing what we lose. <laughs> Always more stuff. But that's really cool. But they were sad. And the thing is, they were they were jealous because they wanted everybody following them. All right. So they locked them up. Let's keep going. But <laughs> you know, whenever you see a lot of human stuff going on, then the Bible says, "But pay attention. Here comes Jesus." But during the night, the Lord sent an angel who appeared before them. He supernaturally opened the prison doors and brought the apostles outside. Isn't that neat? And so this is really huge. Because here in verse 19, I want to talk a little bit about this because there are other times when people have went to prison and the angel didn't let them out. They had to go through it. But the church was just getting started, wasn't it? It was just getting its footing and its traction. So I want to talk about some of the reasons really why this happens right here in this early church. Number one, it showed the, the apostles and the disciples in the church that God was protecting them. You think about it. This, the, 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 the highest power in the land, the, the Sanhedrin Council, had used that power wrong. They'd abused their power, locked them up because they were jealous. They just want to get them off the street. They want to try to stop their following. But look at this. It's, it, it's so the apostles, and I mean, they're still getting their feet under them with this, this whole new church thing. And here comes an angel. He opens up the door and says, come on out. Can you imagine what that did for their faith and trust in God to share the gospel and to preach? Oh, my gosh. You're like, wow, the highest people in the land tried to stop us. And God sent an angel to go around them. My gosh, that's amazing. And so that was a big encouragement. Keep representing God. He's got you. He's got you. And I'm going to tell you, that's the same thing to us. You keep representing God. He's got you. What can man do to us? He can't do any more than God lets him or or her. Mm -hmm. We're in his hand and we're safe. So don't worry about that. You just keep being nice and loving people. Now, if you're a jerk, your own butt's on the line, okay? (laughs) If you're a jerk, Holy Spirit and angel both will step back and say, you're going to get what's coming. (laughs) You know, he will. He's done it to me before. Yeah. You know, don't go out here and preach turn or burn, baby. You don't get nasty with it. Just say, hey, let me tell you a little bit about my Jesus. And do it right, and then Holy Spirit will stay in the game with you, and angels will protect you. <laughs> oh, but, you know, another thing that was really significant about this specific thing was many of the people who were there in the temple area, you know, under Solomon's porch, that area where they were teaching, a lot of people who were there, they were on the scene whenever the high count, the high priest and the council sent the, the captain of the temple guard off to grab them, drag them off and lock them up. So the public saw that. They knew that the, the, the basically they had been locked up. All right. And so what's cool is because many of those same people saw the apostles early the next morning in the same spot preaching and teaching again. <laughs> well, this what's going to say right here. Because see, whenever the when the angel brought them outside, here's what he said. And I'm using the New American Standard for a reason here. It says, go stand and speak to the people in the temple area. The same spot. The same spot they were drug out of. Now don't you go back to that same spot and preach again. <laughs> Isn't that neat? It says, look at this, the whole <clears throat> message of this life. Mm-hmm. There's a reason why I picked this translation. The the angel wanted them to share the whole gospel. Okay? Not just the salvation of the soul. And I preached this before. And I, I'm telling you, the gospel's bigger than just the saving of a soul. That'd be big enough, wouldn't it? That's enough. Eternal life's enough. But the gospel's bigger than that. He says the whole message. Preach about 
the Messiah, of the fact that he came, lived, and died. And if you trust him, you'll have eternal life. But also, teach about Holy Spirit, what he does in your life, about being baptized in him. Also, teach about the fact that what God just did, he protects us, he watches out for us, he meets our needs, he heals our bodies, he, he provides for our family. You see, that the gospel's big. Whenever you're sick, it's good news when he heals you. Whenever you're broke, he gives you a dollar, that's good news. So the gospel is everything. And that's why I like it in this translation because a lot of the older translations of the word for it say the whole gospel. They just said, tell them everything you know about this life with Jesus. Isn't that neat? In church, that's where we have to be. We have to tell people the whole gospel, the whole gospel, the whole truth. You know, don't, don't leave things out. You know, and, and whenever, if you lead somebody to Christ, tell them, hey, look, I'd like to say it's a cakewalk from here on into glory, but it ain't. Mm -hmm. It's going to be harder a lot of times, but he's with you. He will help you. See, nobody really told me that part. I thought, well, I trusted Christ. Hallelujah, man, me and Jesus. It's going to be just easy street. I wish somebody said, oh, but it's good. You and Jesus are going to be great, but. Be hard sometimes. But you know, that's part of the gospel. So anyway, let's keep rolling. But the whole gospel. And it wasn't even as, as they're preaching the gospel and teaching the, the full scope of what Jesus provides and who he is. And they're doing that early in the morning before the Sanhedrin council even got out of bed. You see? So that these people say, wait a minute. There's, they haven't even stood trial. They haven't even had a chance to go free. What happened? How did they get arrested and they're back here while all of our high exalted people are still taking a nap? You know? So this is just, that's why the angel did that. Okay, so that morning, they entered the temple courts and taught the people. This is before the council could even assemble. And you can imagine the awe of God in the people like, whoa. The priest stepped in, they had them arrested, and they're they're right back. They couldn't have stood trial. You it, what God will meet us in our in our thought process as well. When we don't understand something, but we know God's there, a lot of times that's the thing that pulls us in deeper. And Holy Spirit says, see, see something. There's bigger. God's at work. This is bigger than mm -hmm. so you know how God works like that. He'll just get you that place where like, how could that happen? Oh man, nobody could have done that. And that's what he was doing with this. So that's one reason the angel released, released them also. Um, so let's keep rolling. It says the high priest and his officials, unaware of their supernatural release from prison, and, and I'm, this is not scripture, but I would say probably slept a little late that morning. <laughs> that's not Bible. But you know, they think, oh, we got to, we took care of those, those guys that were harassing us. We got them under control. I can have a leisure morning this morning. I mean, you you know they were more they they rested better that night, thinking that those people who were driving them crazy were locked up. Uh, so it's so an unaware of their supernatural release from prison convened the members of the Supreme Council. They sent for the apostles to be brought to them from prison. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't know if they drank coffee or tea or what they were drinking, but I bet some of them spilled some, whatever. <laughs> when they found out they spewed. Oh, man, you know that shook them up. <laughs> My good morning is gone. It says verse 22. It says, but, here we go again. But when the officers came to the prison cell, it was empty. They returned to the council and informed them. Look at verse 23. We found the jail securely locked and the guard standing by their cell. But when we opened the door, there was no one inside. A few things here. I think it's really neat. Securely locked. The angel didn't just take them out and leave the door open. Do you understand? The angel let them out and went back and said, cha ching. <laughs> and shut them. And when they got outside, I'm sure he probably said, wake up, guards. So the guards are standing there, nothing's happened, the cell's locked, nobody broke in, nobody, you know, there wasn't like a, a prison break happened. 
Everything was perfect, and the guards are still standing there doing their job, and ain't nobody home in there. Right? <laughs> Isn't that so cool? Did they, you see the detail. They made sure that everything was locked and everything was just right. Only God. Mm -hmm. That was indisputable proof that a miracle had happened. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Well, verse 24 says, Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed. They were confused. Look at this, but, but look at this. They weren't confused about the possibility that God had stepped in. I want you to see their one track mind. They're like that horse with those blinders. They could only see selfishness and self and human and flesh. That's all they could see. They were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. You see that? They weren't like, how could this happen? Maybe God's with them. No. No, what they did was they said, What's going, to, what's going to come of it? People are going to hear about this. Oh, my gosh. We're going to look bad. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that ridiculous? A, a miracle happened, and they, all they care about is how they're going to look. And probably even more so, how the apostles and Jesus are going to look. Mm -hmm. That was a confusion. How can I save my, my, my behind in this situation? How can I make us look good? Because we've got to stop this. And that's really sad that you know people get that that degree of tunnel vision because of selfishness. But all of us could do it. All of us. We get so fixed on what we want, a lot of times we can't see God, can we? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened here. Those people are so fixed on their own plan and their own agenda that they could not see God at work. That help us not not be so blinded like that. Mm -hmm. Verse 25. It says, but someone came and told them, the men who you put in prison are standing right here in the temple area teaching the people. Look at it. The people you put in jail are back in the temple still doing the stuff. So the captain of the temple guard and his offers, and might I add, these are the same ones who locked them up the night before. Okay? <laughs> they have history. <laughs> they went to arrest them once again, at least, but without using force. You see here? For they were afraid the people had stolen. And that's something. People went to worship and they did not go in that temple without their bag of rocks. Because <laughs> you never know when somebody might need to get pelted. <laughs> you, you see, all over the place. People are afraid of getting stoned. They're getting stoned or something's happening. It's like, how many rocks were there around Jerusalem in that area? My gosh. I laugh about it, you know. And, you know they never, everywhere, everywhere they were, they had they had some rocks. That's fun. I guess that's like a concealed carry permit now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see that character have his cloak on and pull it out. He's got a big, a big shoulder holster of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 26. Which kind of like that because, you know, it was always a danger getting hit upside with a head with a rock if you said the wrong thing. That's right. And so the car, so, so we go to his office, they were very careful, and very polite, and said, please, would you mind coming with us? <laughs> you see here, it doesn't say nothing about laying hands. No. No, they were nice this time. Well, I'll just read 27 and 28. It says, when they brought them before the council, the high priest demanded an explanation. Well, look at this. Here's what he wanted to hear. Look at this. You see this tunnel vision again. He doesn't say, how did you get out of jail? Right. That, that's good. That would have been my question. Yeah, me too. How did you get out of jail? The guards were standing there. The guards were standing there. How did that happen? I'd be in the first question. be like, tell me. Tell me. But no, he's like, didn't we strictly warn you that you are never again to teach in this name? But instead, you have now filled all of Jerusalem with this doctrine and committed to holding us responsible for this man's death. You know, one thing that's good about it is there's a thread here and a guilt trip here, but in the middle there was a compliment. 
<laughs> you can feel all Jerusalem with his dust trim. I bet when Peter knew heard that, they said, shit. <laughs> That's what they heard. I have fun, you know, have fun with the word fun teaching. But anyway, they didn't need, they, they didn't care how they got out of jail. They didn't care that it was a bona fide miracle of God. They didn't care. They said, look, why aren't you doing what we told you to do? And one of the things that's interesting to me is, do you notice that you they you never hear them say Jesus' name? Yeah. Uh -huh. They don't say it. Look at this. Did we tell you never teaching this name? They won't even say his name. Isn't that terrible? You know why? It's because there's power in his name. Mm -hmm. There's power in Jesus' name. And they were convicted and guilty, and they knew it. But they wouldn't talk about it. Please, and now fill all Jerusalem with this teaching. That's what they, you know, they, you can say, you can almost see the nose rise. This teaching. And they are committed to holding us responsible for this man's death. Look at, they won't say Jesus. They just will not say Jesus. You know, the more I, the more I study the scripture, the longer I walk with God, the more messed up these people were of course, just the more I see their attitudes and their actions and their selfishness and their, their, their tunnel visionness with just wanting to stay in power and just control everything and everybody. It's just, I'm like, how can somebody go that far down that road and get that messed up? Mm -hmm. The religious leaders of the whole nation, and they still can't even see God. They couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see the truth. They couldn't see the miracles. They couldn't. People being healed right in front of them, they still couldn't see that God was working. It's like, well, didn't they say in the Bible that those people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and stuff, could not see Jesus for who he was? Well, yeah, it does. It says that they were blind. They yeah, couldn't see him. Exactly. But also Jesus says you were, you were entrusted with the oracle. You were entrusted to get the people ready is what it says in several places. It says God entrusted you to prepare my people for my coming is what it's saying. And you blew it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they were blind. It says they were blind as well. But it's one thing to be blind with secondhand information and secondhand evidence. That's another thing to be blind whenever it's happening right in front of you. You know, that is, that's just a cold, that's like Pharaoh, cold-hearted heart. But the thing is, they had to do what they had to do. And that's what, like Peter said, right on the day of Pentecost, he said, look, you did it in ignorance because what was written had to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So really, I think that they messed up so long that it was time and God just literally hardened their heart and blinded them so they would fulfill the, the what had to happen prophetically for the Messiah to, to die. Mm -hmm. So they had a role to play. But once again, I'm going to say they chose to be in that role. They chose to go there. Yes, Brent? They were hung up on their authority and Jesus' authority was higher than theirs and they knew it inside. So that's, that's where their hang-up was at. Yeah, it was the they had the authority, but they didn't have as much among the people as he was gaining, and that that messed them up. Yeah, I bet you're right. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't. Yeah, you're right, Brent. And but in that way, you know, once you have that much authority, my gosh, man, you better have some humility with it. That's the problem. They had authority with no humility, and that's why the greatest leaders are, are servants. The greatest leaders have the most humility. They really do. I mean, look at Jesus, the greatest among you will be the one who serves. Right. Yeah, you got to be a servant. And then God will promote you. If you got a humble servant's heart, God will promote you. You don't have to worry about that. You just serve, and you'll be surprised when it happens. You'll be surprised. I mean, when God promotes you, you'll be like, me. <clears throat> the people who want the promotion don't get it. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. People want it really desperately and fight for it. They don't get it. And if, and if they find a way to finagle in, guess what? Their character's revealed, and then they fall. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who get to a place where their character cannot sustain them. You see it with athletes all the time. You see it with people. They get to a place of all this influence, and they have no character to stay there. And they, and, and they do stupid stuff, and they fall because their character is not ready. But if you humble yourself on the side of the Lord, then he'll lift you up. Yeah. Because your character will be ready for the spot he gives you. So, Okay, verse 29. We've got a couple more verses, and we'll wrap up tonight. It says, Peter and the apostles, apostles replied, we must listen to and obey God more than pleasing religious leaders. 
Okay. <laughs> I like that. Isn't it? It's got to go with God. It's got to go with God. And these are our last three verses tonight. It says, you had Jesus. Look at this. I like, look how he, Peter starts out. Hey, we're going to serve God no matter what you say, unless, you, unless what you say agrees with what he says. All right, we're going we're gonna to go with that. And then I love it. And then Peter takes this moment. You, and look, you had Jesus arrested and killed by crucifixion, but the God of our forefathers has raised him up. You see what he's saying? Look, you did it. You murdered but just so you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our father, the God that we Israelites worship, the one that you say you revere and represent, guess what? He raised him up, Sadducee. He was resurrected, Sadducee. Just one more kick. Wham! Yeah, uh, because you know, that was the You remember that's the one, one of the main things they had a problem with them. Remember when the first time they, they, they got them was because they were preaching the resurrection, remember? Mm -hmm. They didn't like that. So here we go again. It says in verse 31, he's the one, Jesus is the one God exalted and seated at his right hand as our savior and champion. You see that? What he's doing, he's, he's building a case right here. It says, he is the provider of grace. He is the Messiah as a redeemer of Israel. But look at this, he's saying, the God we, 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 we love, the God we respect, the God of our forefathers, the God of our promises, raised up Jesus, and by the way, he's seated at the right hand of power now, and he's also the promised Messiah that was to come. And they would know that Sanhedrin, they'd memorized, you know, all the first five books of the Bible, they knew the promises. And so they would, he was, he was just all over with this. What's well, neat to me about Peter is Peter had three years with Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see the wisdom of the Holy Spirit right here. Mm -hmm. You know, Peter was half, half Greek, half Jew. He was not a full Jewish person. Peter was not. I think his father was a Greek and his mother was a Jew. But the thing is, is so he was raised actually outside of Jerusalem. So his, and him and his brother Andrew, and so they, they had this, this, this Greek background. So they didn't know a lot. Of, they didn't have, I mean, this kind of savvy, this is Holy Spirit. This is Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All right. It says in verse 32, and by the way, we are witnesses of these things. Our witnesses. This isn't secondhand revelation here. This is real. This was us. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God freely gives to all who believe in him. See, we're witnesses, like, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one behind all this stuff that's going on. He's the one who's doing this stuff. He's the one who's witnessing that by the healings, by the miracles, by all this stuff going on. Whom God freely gives to all who believe in Him. So, any thoughts or or anything tonight as we wrap up? Last verse must have really got him because basically he's saying you're cut out of it because of your non-belief. So the Holy Spirit isn't at your back end. Amen. Yeah, there is. A, this is a ton of wisdom that Peter shared. Yeah. And you know the conviction that had to be coming on those guys, even though they were so cold-hearted and, and tunnel-visioned of a, of a group, you know, you know that, I mean, Peter, the apostle, and these other apostles and disciples sharing with them. And I mean, it's like, you know, soon we see Stephen get stoned. And it says they start gnashing their teeth and all because of anointing so heavy on Stephen. They can't handle it. But being that kind of conviction, like you said, Brent, not to... To, to know that you're cut out of the cut out of the promises. My gosh, any other thoughts? Yes. This may be dumb, but it Peter's principle: a person rises to the top of their level as far as they can go, and and that's as much as they can do. They can't go any further, and then they go, you know, go down. And you were saying about the people. I'm messing this all up. I'm but is that, is that a a biblical or scriptural thing? Peter's principle. They were talking about Peter and the scribes and whatever. They go to the top of their level and then they but then they can't believe, so they come down. Like before they were manhandling the disciples and then they figured out, oh, we can't do that. So they lowered themselves 
in the people's eyes or themselves. It's, I'm trying to track it's you. It's an old business. I'm act. not sure. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me, but uh, sure. I'm yes, happy. Dorothy. There was a book and a movie back in. 70s maybe or mm -hmm. 80s okay. it was called the peter principle right. it, yeah and right. what it was was people they get a good job at the bottom so they get moved up yes doing a good job get moved up yes after a while they're just getting moved up and they reach the pinnacle of what they can do okay mm -hmm. yeah okay it says here the peter principle states that a person who is confident at their job will earn a promotion to a position that requires different skills. If the promoted, um, okay, um, they tend to rise to a level of respective incompetence. Employees are promoted based on their success in previous jobs until they reach a level at which they are no longer confident as skills yeah. in one do not necessarily translate to the other. That's right. Okay. That clarified. I thought I was tracking, but I, will, I didn't want to sure. Yeah. Well, what happens is you can only go as high as your character can sustain you. Yeah. You understand? It's not biblical. It's not no, biblical. It's a, it's a, it's a, no. It's a business premise. It was written by um, Peter Hall. It's more of an anecdote. Yeah, oh, it's not. It's not biblical. It doesn't happen. That. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do know that I do know that your character does play a huge role in what within the what the authority God will give you. You understand? That's why the Bible says, "Don't lay hands suddenly on anybody, because they'll be lifted up with pride, and then when they fall, basically they'll take you down with them, or they'll hurt the church." Mm -hmm. But but I do know that character and is is the that is the this way, the, the character in your heart and in your life is the most important thing between you and God. Mm -hmm. It is. Because if you're, if basically, you can have all the gifting and ability in the world, but you don't have, if you don't have the character to go with it, basically, it doesn't matter what opportunities you get, you're still going to not do them well because you don't have the character and integrity to do them well. You see? Yeah. So there's kind of a, there's, there's a, a mix of it, but I mean, I to me, and I'm not trying to be weird with this, but um, like I've said plenty of times, we work with people's heart, not their gifting. Mm -hmm. We work with their heart, not their ability. Because ability will open all kinds of doors for you, but character's really what comes out as you do those things. All right. So while it might, I guess it technically could be a biblical thing, I believe it is to some extent, because you have to have good character to be entrusted with stuff from God. Mm -hmm. You have to. Isn't that part of the reason why you preached on character not long ago? Yeah. To encourage us as believers, both individually and corporately, to continue to work inside yes. with our relationship to God. Because if we have the plumbing right, mm -hmm. right, yeah. our plumbing is always headed towards God and Jesus, yeah. then we continue in our character and allow us to be more equipped to yeah. do God's kingdom work. Yes, okay. that's right. And that's why Jesus said the greatest among you will be with the one who serves because only with somebody with good character and a lot of humility and prefers other people and has, you know, has the stuff in here is the one that's going to get promoted consistently because they can work with people, they can love people, they can care for people, they can be selfless and give where needed, you know. So the character is a thing that's really important to really to move up in promotion and authority in the kingdom. Right. It's a character thing. It just is. If you got if you got crappy character, God can't trust you, and people ain't gonna work with you. <laughs> Does it make sense? Does that help a little bit? Yeah. No. Yeah. It was basically. Uh, I forgot your name. Dorothy. Dorothy. Oh, Dorothy. Dorothy. Yeah. It's it just flipped back to a time period when I read yeah. about the Peter's principle, and I was just wondering if it was tied into the Bible, but it doesn't sound like it. It, it sounds like we have two separate things, but yet there is, I mean, I was sticking kind of with the biblical procedure of, 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 of advancing and responsibility and authority. But the Peter principle too is, you know, I think there's a little bit of difference there, but yeah, yeah so yeah. I guess I didn't answer anything, but I tried. <laughs> yes. Kind of an example, I guess, maybe I'm wrong, but when you look at Judas, 
he was a disciple, so he was on the ladder, yeah. but he had didn't have the character. That's right. Yeah. And and that finally showed. I mean, you know, he was stealing, he was doing all the other stuff, mm -hmm. but he was still a disciple until a certain point. Yeah. And then he couldn't hold back. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have a question. So Judas what played into the whole scheme of things. Yes, he did. So, you know, I mean, he essentially was always supposed to betray Jesus yes. so that he could go on and be crucified and rise again. Mm -hmm. So so Jesus picked him knowing He picked him because of a screwy character. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and yes. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotta remember that the things that um transgressed through from before Christ was even put on this earth through his uh, life and ministry and even into his death and resurrection that had already been pre-planned by God eons before they actual happened he knew long before yeah. what 